and informal and good sure. good afternoon everyone this is charlotte pierce with ready row usa i am here with two of my favorite people to talk about rowing people to talk about um, learn to row which is i think one of the most important uh i don't know initiatives or to topics in rowing it's uh tara morgan hello tara hi how are you good 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 Thanks and for uh, us. you're welcome. Yeah, you are. You are my go-to expert on learn to row. I know you were on last year, and um, Dave Harvey, who's the founder hey, and coach of Tacoma Rowing. Hi, hi. And we did a, a club spotlight on Dave's um, operation there at, to, in Tacoma, Washington, uh, a few weeks ago. So if you go to Ready Row USA, you can see uh, the get the. What do you call it? The archive. Um, anyway, this is a picture of me in Florida in front of an alligator. So I would not recommend people people uh, go right out and after learn to row and and row with alligators. But uh, that was a fun time. I I um, looks challenging. It slid into the water like right after they took this picture, and I I tore off down the river. I never rode so fast. <laughs> I don't think it was coming after me, but maybe I don't know. It's a good. It makes a good story for the grandchildren. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm uh, the producer of Ready Row USA, and uh, this is the website readyrowusa.com. Um, it's produced by or designed by one of our sponsors, Good Inklings. Uh, Laura Williams is the CEO, and she is offering our listeners a uh, web free website audit this month or season. She'll probably extend it, but um, she's great. I just love her. Uh, and I love what she does for me. She does about five websites for me. Um, we also have uh, Burnham Boatslings. Everybody knows them and one of the best companies around. I, I love uh, stopping by the regattas and talking to um, Peter Kerman and his crew, Linda Murray. It's one of the best companies around. Thank you so much for uh, sponsoring us. And Dave, let's start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about how you structure your Learn to Row. And I was saying uh, that we're trying to focus today on taking those new rowers who have seen this elegant sport on the water <laughs> or not, or they just drop in and they learn. And how do you get them to the point where they're really engaging with the sport and the boat club? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Charlotte, I mean, I think one of the first things is, as you suggested, you know, there's a lot of people who are, have some familiarity with the sport, whether it be through mm -hmm. Boys in the Boat or especially out in the <laughs> Pacific Northwest where Tara and I are with the University of Washington programs. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people who don't have that exposure. And so, you know, reaching out to both groups and, and you kind of need to do that different ways um, and recognize those differences. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we try to keep in mind is there's, you know, kind of two ends of the spectrums, both um, are covered by most established programs. You know, there's the, on the one end of the spectrum, the half day learn to row, come down and it's free and you can get in a boat and get on the rowing machine and that kind of thing. And on the other end of the spectrum, you know, is that long-term commitment or, you know, time mm -hmm. commitment, financial commitment to, you know, a master's, or like a full master's program with racing and everything else. Uh, and there's so much space in between to kind of explore ways to do things and who to reach out to. Um, and so one of the, you know, we talk, we kind of use this framework and say, how do we fill in that spectrum? And one of the first ways that we think about it is what can we do at our site? What can we also do not at our site, right? We could bring a single to a farmer's market and a rowing machine and just mm -hmm. get people interested that way. Um, so there's so many different levers to pull um, and when you recognize how broad this spectrum is, you know, you can start plugging in the gaps and thinking about it different ways. Yeah, there's definitely not a, a one solution to this, you know, and, and I think part of what Dave and I always uh, have to think about is what is our desired outcome, right? Do we want people to join a program and be part of something or do we want to just educate the public or do we want to uh, really engage and collaborate? Right. And yeah, absolutely. 
do you see this this slide if you're listening you you may not see the slides but they will be on our website on our uh, episode uh, um, post but what do you mean by inviting versus selling and maybe you've just alluded to that Dave. sure yeah so this is a distinction we try to be really careful about um you know there's when we invite someone right it, it's bringing someone in and saying you know we want you to we want to share what we have come to know and love the sport of rowing mm -hmm. with you. Um, come join us. Come see what it's about. If you don't like it, great. Like we made a friend, we made a connection. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, versus selling, you know, we kind of describe as being, you know, that's asking someone, hey, we have this master's program. This is the way it's run. This is what it costs. We need you as a customer. You know, how can we convince you to sign up and pay us? You know, um, <laughs> and so being mm -hmm. really careful about that distinction. Um, mm -hmm. And what are we asking people to do? And this kind of grew out of our situation in Tacoma being a very new club and being in an area where there are a lot of people who have no familiarity with rowing um, and who have never been invited to row and don't know anyone who's rowed in college. Um, and so it creates a really um, unproductive dynamic to go and say, hey, there's a sport you've never been invited to try. You don't know anyone who's ever done it, but mm -hmm. we want you to come pay us money. Um, yeah. as opposed to creating a bunch of opportunities for people to just explore the sport almost at their own pace. Mm -hmm. you know. And I think one of the things I, I like keep in mind is we met a woman named Marcella who is a teacher and runs her own apparel company. And she came down, we got on the rowing machine, then we moved to the dock box. And she was on the dock box, we were just talking, and she was in the dock box for like 20 minutes just going, loved it, you know, <laughs> and we just kind of let that go. Like she was just having so much fun and she's like, yeah. you know, I said, do you want to get in the boat? And she's like, you know what? I could do this all day. And we just kind of like, so having That's that so cool. flexibility. Yeah. It was such a cool experience for me. And I think, yeah. you know, I, as a coach and a rower, like in my own personality, I kind of say, okay, here are the steps. Like boom, 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 let's go. Mm -hmm. And it really forced me to kind of step back. And I always have that conversation in my mind when I think about like, okay, like slow down, like let people find what they enjoy about the sport. She just loved the rhythmic nature of it, right? Being by the water. She wasn't even on the water yet, but she was by the water. Um, and so creating opportunities for that where you bring people in um, and you're inviting them to be a part of something and kind of discover what the sport means to them. You know, and, and what role saying. do other club members play? I mean, I don't know if you have like regular club members who show up every day or yeah, whatever, but, or Tara, you could answer that too. I mean, what, how can regular club members kind of enhance that experience for people who are new? Well, I think it's a cultural piece. I think if you, another way of saying what Dave's saying is it's a push, it's a pull versus a push strategy. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that people pay attention to in marketing, you know, especially nowadays with social media and things. If mm -hmm. you're pulling people in and instead of pushing your agenda on them and saying, this is what we do, mm -hmm. um, I think that makes a huge difference to people who just want to try it, you know. And I used to always tell my Learn to Row students, like, you know what, if this is a bucket list item and you're checking it off and you're done as soon as this class is over, fabulous. Good for you. <laughs> If you stumble into something that you find that you could do for the rest of your life or for the next year or so, mm -hmm. fabulous. And I think when I came in to learn to row as a coach, there was a big emphasis on following a model. I was handed a binder. Here's the thing. And the ultimate goal mm -hmm. was to create paying mm -hmm. members into the club. But I think it's a flawed, it's absolutely flawed because if mm -hmm. that actually works, imagine your club actually getting 20 new members like you imagine the chaos which actually happened at the parks department program where i taught for over 10 years um it was too successful they didn't know what yeah. to do with 20 to 40 pe new people a year so i think you have to really manage people's expectations and you have to give people grace you know learning yeah. room for grace and room for learning those are very important aspect yeah i think sometimes the club just gets so invested in securing these people that they don't think about just kind of letting them come in. Um, Dave, you have a, like some specific steps about when, when new people sort of, are you talking about when they drop by the, the, the club or the facility or just, yeah, you know, this, you have a program you know, or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, you know, we have a bunch of different programs where people can get their first kind of entree into the sport. And so, mm -hmm. um, 
this, you know, and, and we always try to use analogies, right. To get through to our, our committed rowers, like <laughs> use rowing analogies. Right. And so the way we describe it is obsess over the details of a new person coming in for the first time, just like you would before a race, right. You check everything, you recheck everything, you have a plan, you, you know, there's so much preparation that goes into it. And so, mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, not, again, it's more about the inviting piece in a preparation in an inviting way and not in a, selling way or the push pull analogy that Tara used that's a really good a way to use it especially for the sport sure. um so when people come mm -hmm. to the facility like what are they going to see when they walk in and what you know i think especially for us like that first two minutes we try to be really careful about um like are they exposed to a bunch of jargon are people's backs turned to them um you know just really thinking about the first two minutes mm -hmm. um especially you know in a lot of this for us um, you know, we are reaching out to communities that haven't traditionally been involved in the sport. And so, you know, we want to be really careful about what we're asking people to step into. Um, and the analogy we use with our folks is the experienced folks is, you know, you've taken that fairly first awkward stroke on the water um, and you got through it. And so, you know, but this like you have to step back to what that was like for you that first day when all of a sudden you hear port, mm -hmm. starboard, bow, stern. You know all this stuff square feather right and and what are you asking people to step into and is it welcoming and fun um it's got to be fun for everybody um, yeah Tara so mentioned we, that in her later but um yeah go ahead yeah and so um you know one of the things we talk about is like we assign carefully kind of pick someone to be, kind of be that new person's ambassador for the day um meet them in the parking lot because we are kind of tucked around just where our physical location is we're tucked around the corner you can't necessarily see us from the parking lot so we have someone meet them in the parking lot who knows what they look like um, most times and, you know, walks them around the corner. That gives them a chance to kind of introduce themselves before they see all the rowing shells and all the equipment and it gets things could get overwhelming. Um, and another really important piece that we found is, um, you know, folks, the new folks names. Um, so we put their names up on the whiteboard um, and kind of expect everyone who's there to know the person's name take it upon themselves to introduce themselves at some point, um, you know, not necessarily all in the first few minutes, um, but at some point in the day. Um, and also, you know, learn how to pronounce someone's name uh, before they get there, you know, and, um, you know, that that makes a huge difference for folks. And so just little things like that, um, when you kind of piece them all together, make for a very different experience for new folks um, when they're kind of trying to come into this sport. And I think, um, you know, it's interesting, especially um, be, because we are reaching out so much to communities who have not been involved in rowing. Um, we just try to be really careful um, about what we're asking them to walk into. Uh, and so a lot of times we'll even say to new folks, okay, if you want to, or to our experienced folks, like when have you been that only person in that other environment, you know, and make sure yeah. that they have had some sort of experience like that, or at least reflect on it to kind of make sure we're all on the same page about what it should be like. Yeah, those are really important. Yeah, it's it's almost worth putting them up on your bathroom mirror. <laughs> Anything to add to that, uh, Tara? Well, I think, yeah. you know, you have to handpick your volunteers who are going to help with this. You can't just put a call out and say, hey, yeah. it's Learn to Row Day. I mean, you really need to have people who mm -hmm. aren't the type who are going to be overly nervous or overly controlling of their situation. You need to have people who really, truly can connect and you have to debrief them, or I called it a pre-brief, you know, doing a pre-brief before the event and say, here's what you can expect out of your experience as a volunteer. And here's, you know, things to think about, like thinking about your why, like why you row and how you could uh, express that to someone. Uh, one thing we used to do was a huddle with our master's rowers and the new rowers and we would do this a couple of times. So the first day we would just say, why rowing? Why now? You know, like mm -hmm. why, why rowing? Why now? Oh, it looked kind of interesting or I trust my friend who invited me or whatever. But you also ask the same question of your master's volunteers. So you kind of level the playing field by asking everyone the same kind of question in a huddle, you know, and kind of get that team feel and where um, people might feel disoriented. You know, you're doing a geographic orientation. You're saying, mm -hmm. hey, who's never actually been on the water in Tacoma? Or who's actually 
you know, the city looks different from the water. You get yeah. disoriented. And we all know when we learn to row that disorientation is a big component. We're going backwards. Our right is our not our left. We don't, we get um, overwhelmed with stimuli. And telling people, you know, oh, you know, here's where Tacoma is and here's where the parking lot is. And just once they're on the water, reminding them of those things and, and helping people stay oriented because that's where you can really lose people. You see them start to grip and you see them start to clench yeah. and they're like, you know, and you have to have people helping you who can read body language and who don't necessarily like act on it, but might say, hey, so, you know, Bob over there, he's looking a little stressed. So then you like, you know, ask Bob about what he had for dinner yesterday. And, you know, <laughs> like ask him his favorite movie. And you kind of just get to know people that way. So you should you should definitely stock your volunteers with some easy questions, yeah. maybe, well, maybe to ask people, you know, mm -hmm. and just get to know people. Because sometimes in Learn to Rose, there's a lot of standing around mm -hmm. uh, while things get done. And that's a that's an opportunity. Yeah, that's it kind of goes to my... Um my point about, you know, engaging the, the existing membership and giving them a little sort of script almost to, to what to say to people when they're new, because we can all get kind of entrenched in our, in our routine when we're rowing. But Right. And um, as rowers, we're always worried about getting it wrong, right? Because yeah, there's such yeah. consequence when you get it wrong, yeah. you flip, you piss off other people, you, you know, there's all these, you can immediately feel the interdependence. And for some people, that's a really tough place yeah. to be, whether you're being interdependent with nature, or whether you're being interdependent with another rower or someone who's having a Got conversation it. with you. Yeah. So, And Dave, something you've thought about a lot, I know, uh, from talking to you from before is this topic the elephant in the room mm -hmm. people who may not see themselves I love in this. this sort of exclusive sport um <laughs> what do you uh what are your yeah. suggestions on that <laughs> yeah so um so what we say is when you're delivering an invitation that's 100 years late don't make it a big commitment don't make it expensive don't expect a yes don't make it about you you know um and I think that helps kind of frame things the way it should be, right? Like if you're delivering an invitation that's 100 years late, someone invites you to an event that already happened, you know, like eh, you might, <laughs> yeah. uh, you might not get a super cheery response about it, right? And that's fine. Um, you shouldn't necessarily expect a yes. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we try to just be really careful about that um, and just mm -hmm. create like low barrier events mm -hmm. for people to come try things out, right? Like our Monday morning um, row we, that we do for BIPOC entrepreneurs. We have two time slots. We tell people if you can make it, great. If you want to bring someone new and they don't have a chance to fill out the paperwork ahead of time, that's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, it's free. Like, and just being, just creating opportunities for people to. And come that's and try been pretty work. successful, right? You have people coming, the BIPOC entrepreneurs. Um, mm -hmm. Time, you've you've run it for three weeks now. So, yeah, yeah. So yeah. third week, uh, it's been great. Like great response in the community, and you know almost everyone who's come down says, Oh, I know this other person I'm going to bring next time. Or, you know, could we, can I bring my kids, you know? And like, it's just, it's kind of, you can kind of see it starting to snowball. Um, and so it's awesome to see. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and we'll keep in, in touch with you about that and, and your other programs that are going on this summer, but I wanted to get into a few of Tara coach Tara's tips. She's, um, these will be on our website, on our uh, episode site, uh, readyrowusa.com slash learn to row. And so if you don't take notes, just listen and Tara will kind of go through these. You touched on some of them already, right, Tara? Right. Yeah. I think the team thing, I think we underestimate the team huddle at the beginning of an event and the end of an event. I think you always need to have that, um, you know, eye contact. Um, I know with social distancing, we may not be getting too cozy with each other, but um, mm -hmm. there's still an opportunity to um, really connect with people. Um, when when I used to teach Learn to Row in the Parks Department program, I would be faced with 20 to 25 students in one class, mm -hmm. and they were signing up for a three-month class. And, you know, you ask people on the street about rowing, and I just had this conversation with someone the other day. They're like, what do you wear? 
you know? So when you make a phone call, I used to have a, I used to have a script and I would say, hi, you know, and, and I think them hearing my voice and saying, I got you, like, it's okay. Adult learners are really fragile little egos sometimes, you know? And they're just, you know, they just need all the basics. And they're also usually the CEOs of their lives, right? They're a parent, they have their own company, they are a manager or some, you know, they, they're CEOs. Yeah, they're not so used they, to being vulnerable like that or, or not right. in charge, yeah. And people like to have information mm -hmm. and you have two ways of presenting it because not everybody's a good listener, right? So the phone call is helpful. And you say, I'm going to follow up with an email and you tell them what to bring, you know, a water bottle and some layers. You tell them what to wear. <laughs> close fitting clothing that's not going to get caught in a lot of things and you give them ideas you know yoga pants or leggings or just come as you are you know yeah. you don't know and i always say no need to go buy anything special um you will we'll figure it out uh, i tell them where to meet and what they're going to expect uh, to happen when they get there um i usually do something like a question of the day you know like mm -hmm. who's seen a great movie you know just to get everybody on the same playing field um, and then for us, it was really important to not have that idle time. And when you're dealing with a learn to row class, um, they had a routine. They came in the door, they put their name up and told me that they were there and signed in, right? Because that's a big, big thing with uh, rowers, got to have their name on the on the board, um, however you do that. And then I would have them uh, have a self directed sort of warm up like a dynamic warm up. Um, but it was something that I designed early on so that I accomplished a lot without me actually having to actively coach them. So for mm -hmm. instance, they would come and they would find someone they'd never rode next to before and they would both get on an erg and they would cox each other in how to do a pick drill, right? That's and we taught, brilliant. And we taught them how to do that. So you, you're knocking out coxing, communication, <laughs> you know, pick drill all in one thing and, and bonding, the like bonding with your fellow and yeah, yeah and they're bonding and the other thing we would do is ab 100 which was just this five five ab exercises all continuous there's 20 uh reps of each and then i actually would say to them and you guys are going to do a three minute plank and what this did was over the course of the class um people you know you have to watch people's bodies obviously you're not going to let people do stuff but it was amazing to see people progress. And I'd say your homework is to do this every day and make it a family challenge. So include your family in the AB 100. And here's a, here's a sheet you can put on the refrigerator and everybody can do it. And, mm -hmm. and here's how to do a three minute plank, you know, just set up as long as you can put an iPhone in front of you. You can watch a little video on YouTube or on TikTok now, <laughs> and you can just plank while you're watching, you know, like we just tried to do things that would show them, both yeah. how to stay in the game because when you row you got to keep rowing usually you can't stop as much i mean it depends on the program but it was people that in your picture here <laughs> yeah you're teaching them how to yeah. sustain how to support each other and how to sustain yeah. so that was, was a big part what of the ab 100 it. is because i which probably means that i it's something i need to do <laughs> 20 crunch, 20 bicycle, 20 straight leg lift, 20 scissor, 20 hip lift. Oh, okay. I'll think about that for a while. <laughs> yeah. It's not the, it's not for every body. So there's modifications. No, I know. I know. I did, we all need to work on our core. I mean, seriously. Like but crazy. what it did for the coaches was it built us time to do yeah. lineups, to uh -huh, assign yeah. equipment, okay. to uh, help people, um, you know, it's like, okay, now we're ready to go. Cause that idle time really makes people nervous, you know, and we have to also appreciate that not everybody's comfortable with water. So we have to really gauge um, their confidence level. And some programs require float tests before they even come in the door. I think that's a, a huge barrier to participation yeah, for a lot yeah, of people. And especially in the BPOC community, uh, going to a pool or going into the water mm -hmm. with um, the hair uh, issues can be really uh, prohibitive. So you have to give people a lot of warning, like, okay, this is the expectation. Um, and, and just keeping go, people sorry, happy. Yeah, mm -hmm. just keeping people happy, you know. Yeah, I got it, yeah. Before we go on to Tara's second set of tips, um, Dave, anything to add to this or? No, I think I, I've learned a lot from Tara in my time <laughs> trying to get someone <laughs> rowing up and running. So I'll let her keep going. I know. <laughs> oh, okay. 
As far as I did it for a long time. I learned a lot. Desk goes, they won't even let us do it at community rowing. <laughs> so this picture actually is a, a group of rowers, learned to row, obviously, who got themselves caught on a buoy. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is a, a tip for coaches that, uh, you know, if you have to do singles, really, really be conservative, keep people close to shore. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was very privileged for that for 10 years. I got to teach in eights and quads and so i had a very clear sight on everybody and you know teaching people right up front um to stay close by here's a signal a you know here here's my signal mm -hmm. for uh to asking you to stop or turn around you know yeah. telling people those things ahead of time and then understanding that their brains are scrambled most of the time in learn to row and you have to be like okay i see I you know, yeah. let's take a deep breath and we're going to start, you know, from here. I, you know, I've seen learn to row coaches who are trial by fire coaches and just, ah, you know, yell, yell, yell. And it's just, it, it, it's the old school. We are not old school right now. So, okay. What else? Yeah. So cool. Uh, let's go on to your next set. And again, these will be on the website at readyrowusa.com on our episode website. Um, yeah. Okay. So the mid row, the midway rower self-evaluation, this was a game changer because I, as a coach had 20 people with big eyes looking at me and sometimes they missed the day that we talked about feathering or they missed, you know, they didn't quite get it or whatever. And so I developed a self-evaluation for rowers kind of midway through their learning process. And it gave me as a coach, a guide of where I had missed the mark. And I would say, okay, guys, we're going to take two steps back because I'm seeing a lot of people feeling nervous about this skill. And so mm -hmm. it helped me not just plow through my curriculum, you know, whatever my curriculum was. And, and, and it also gave them a sense. And I would ask them things like, what's your favorite part about rowing so far? And what's a, what's a, a goal finish line that you've crossed uh, in learned rows so far. And it might just be a personal thing. Like I managed to get here at five 30 in the morning, three days a week, you know, whatever it was. Um, I found it to be critical. I call it the receiving end, which is basically when you onboard your learn to rows into your master's programs, uh, you have to meet with those coaches and you have to find out what their expectations is. I learned this the hard way where I handed off a group of learn to row students and they had never gone above a 24, right? Because it just it didn't occur to me, mm -hmm. you know, they started from the finish. And at that point, the boathouse was starting from the catch. So you have to integrate and meet with those coaches and say, what, I don't want to give you a project. So what can I, what kind of rower can I give and you? And by the receiving coach, you mean the one who's going to take them into a program after they're learned to row, yeah. Right. And this can be done, you know, in a simple email or in most likely a, a meeting is best. And if they can even visit your learn to row practice and say, hey, mm -hmm. you know, the let's let's back those people up and, and let's get them back. Um, I said something already about handpicking volunteers, but I love love using really recent learn to row graduates to help teach learn to row because they can see how far they've come and they can really relate um, as opposed to your like 30 year guy who's been there and rah, 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 you know, lift your hands, you know, the, those guys, you know, like, it, you know, the whole joke of learn to row is ports raise your hands and the ones that actually do this, you know, and it's like, yeah. no, yeah, <laughs> you know, we meant to raise your hand. Um, and then out of this, I actually developed a knowledge, skills, and abilities I call the KSAs. And these are just a, out of those conversations with coaches, I built a basic curriculum and I would say, okay, they need to be knowledgeable on this. They need to be competent in this and they need to be proficient. So like boat handling, they need to be absolutely proficient in boat handling. They need to be absolutely proficient in, uh, you know, handling the equipment properly. But they only need to be pretty much competent in a, a pause drill. You know, they need to kind of know what's going on, but you need to be a good receiving coach. So and I developed again, a KSA. KSA. What? What is Knowledge, it? skills, and abilities. And it's abilities. kind of an organizational yeah. development term. Um, but I sent those to you, both the self-evaluation and the KSA. So those should be available for copying, go through them. I yeah. found them to be, it kept me on track and it kept me accountable because it can get really overwhelming for a coach, you know, to, 
be learning a lot of different learning styles, kinesthetic, auditory, visual. Mm -hmm. I sent people home with videos, you know, World Rowing made a great video at one point that actually had in slow motion, a sweep or where the hand feathered and it like slowed it down and it showed that the, hand, the outside hand never moved. I use that all the time. Yeah. One of my coaches told me they would tape. Um, oh, tape wren wrenches. Yeah. yeah wrenches, like, forks. <laughs> yeah. Forks and wrenches and stuff. That yeah. That would have sent me screaming. Oh, the, well, the the I just uh, just shared that tip with somebody recently, and the the kinder, gentler way of doing it is just a, a piece of tape right here, a piece okay. of medical tape, and so it's just a set. Like, it's a sensory. Yeah. Like don't I, don't yeah. bend the tape. Like don't yeah, fold it. the tape. So you know, Besides, little that's one thing little I need to work on after ten years of sculling. So I yeah, try yeah. that tape thing. Um, and then you had a wonderful suggestion uh, that often gets ignored, uh, bypassed, um, inclusive. Well, it's never been done. Own. It's never okay. been done before. Um, you know, this is something that we hosted with the Parks Department in Seattle. And on one doc, we had Seize the Your Foundation uh, showing uh, kids of all abilities and adults of all abilities, mm -hmm. our equipment. And we had our para rowers in the bow seat of our doubles. And on the other dock was an eight, you know, and then in the middle was ergs. And so everybody mixed in nice. the ergs. And then we'd say, you know, if you're identifying um, in this category, we've got great people for a slower approach. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a disability or you just need a little extra, you don't want to be thrown into an eight and sent out on the water with a bunch of volunteers. So we hosted this in 2019. And that was unfortunately the last time we were able to host it. Uh, we won't be doing it this year, but we'll definitely be doing it in 2023. Yeah. And tell us just briefly, we, we're a little over time, but I don't care. <laughs> we can go. Uh, briefly, what CZR Foundation is. I know Steady State Network <laughs> is where you produce your podcast and do other things, but uh, what's, steady, what's CZR? Yeah, so CZR Foundation will be 10 years old in 2023, and we started uh, uh, to champion inclusion in the sport of rowing through team training, thought leadership, and outreach. And what we do is we have an adaptive competitive master's team. Uh, we introduce people to the sport. We have uh, equipment. We have a boathouse. Um, and then we also do outreach events like a National Inclusive Learn to Row Day and what we call Rowing Adventure Day. So we host an event called Rowing Adventure Day with established groups of people. And what that does is it kind of mitigates expectations, right? An intro to row kind of assumes that there's going to be something after it. And sometimes people just want to come and hang out and have this experience. So we call it Rowing Adventure Day. And it's really fun. Lots of hugs, high fives, t-shirts, mm -hmm. you know, snacks. And you, know, you reach out to organizations where yeah, you know, already, like, es already yeah. established organizations. I got uh, it. Okay. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you know, it's like, 20 bucks a head or $10 a head or something like that. Um, but it's really fun. Uh, we can uh, do that with developmentally disabled people all the way up to corporate yeah. um, kind of stuff. And then CZOR just launched the first adaptive rowing coaching certification. Uh, there's mm -hmm. never been one and we launched it in October and we have a cohort now of 22 graduates and we're building and building. So it's really fun. Amazing. Thank you for doing that. Just, yeah. It, it's I, turned out to be more of an inclusion certification mm -hmm. uh, that focuses mm -hmm. on adaptive, but it's really right. uh, comprehensive in terms of uh, outreach strategies and right. how to include. Yeah. We had the, uh, someone you, you know, you know, Bob Berry, I think, right. Mm -hmm. He was on talking about his, his, um, device for blind rowers the uh, remote coach right oh yeah yeah so that was it was a fun discussion but uh, yeah let me ask dave um let's let's go a couple more minutes do you have anything else to add to what um you know tara was talking about or anything of your own or any programs that are coming up at tacoma rowing you want to particularly highlight yeah, I think I, I would put a plug in for, like Tara said, the midway evaluations. Um, we started doing that with youth participants um, just as a way to kind of give them a voice and help them feel empowered. And, and that if they feel like they're not kind of getting what they wanted out of something that's different than their expectations, um, you know, and being able to incorporate that feedback. And it might just be a conversation of like, hey, that's beyond the scope of what we're doing, but absolutely we can cover that, you know, 
when you row this summer, or it might be, you know what, that's a great idea. Like, let's make that change. We'll start today. Um, but giving them that sense of ownership and empowerment, um, yeah. they really seem to love that. Um, and you, you can't just ignore it, right? You've got to like, address the feedback and, and figure it out. Um, but always good ideas when we've done that. And I think similarly with the adult folks, um, because we're asking, you know, especially in Tacoma, a lot of people who have no familiarity with the sport, um, by getting that feedback, um, you know, we it just gives people that sense of like ownership too. Um, and so yeah. like Brene Brown, if you're familiar with her work, she talks about not just DEI, but DEI plus B, which is for belonging and yeah. mm -hmm. giving them that sense of ownership and creating that like, oh yeah, I can contribute an idea to this organization that's not, you know, and it goes back to the inviting versus selling thing. Uh, but yeah, that midway evaluation is, is absolutely mm -hmm. critical. And just, Plus, you know, isn't that the isn't that the whole point of rowing is that you're joining a team and you're belonging and even if you're rowing singles, you're you're part of something and we throw around yeah. the word rowing community all the time. And right. so let's challenge that and just mm -hmm. say, how are we really uh, we talked at CCR about the whole athlete perspective. What's going on in their lives? How are you know, how are they getting home? How are they eating mm -hmm. when they get there? You know, it's you know, is their parent? ill like what's going on and and if we continue to expand that and stop this narrow siloed approach to rowing um which i think kind of is born out of high performance uh <gasps> the high performance world you know we've sort of valued that the whole time like mm -hmm. we need to model that i'm like come on these are adults who have full-time jobs or kids <laughs> who have, have some fun <laughs> homework to do like let's yeah. get back to the love of rowing you yes, know yes i get it you know as someone who started in my 50s rowing mm -hmm. i you know i'm not going to be a national team <laughs> competitor you know but mm -hmm. i i love it and i want to i want to progress and get better and you know i love that aspect of it you know just the constant progression that you you can do with rowing so yeah Definitely. And it appeals to different kinds of people. And, you know, I would love to do a learn to row with Dave. I think we would have so yeah. much fun. <laughs> we should just do so like think of some more topics for learn to row. You know, I, I wanted to talk about, you know, transitioning learn to row to to more long term rowers in this one. But you know, think about some other topics we can and we'll have but, you guys back on. Um, but Charlotte, everything that we've expressed and everything that we've exhibited makes for long-term rowers. If yeah. people feel belonging, they will stay. If they feel connected, they will stay. If they are bitten by the bug, they will stay. And mm -hmm. it all starts with us. And if you really are intentional about how you hand them off, if you will, when they're done mm -hmm. with you and stay connected to them, mm -hmm. um, they'll be there forever, you know, they'll just, or as long as they need to be, you know, it's, it's, yeah. that's how we, create long term. That's a great thought. I will wrap it up. And then we'll, we'll um, this is a wonderful premiere uh, episode for the series. And we'll come back with some more learn to row topics. We also have uh, a great lineup coming up this year. We have um, club news. If, if you visit the website, you can submit your club news. Um, I'm going to be publishing a couple that came in this week. Um, Philadelphia City Rowing has a, an event that's coming up in Harlem. Um, so what Harlem River Rowing, Community Rowing, I think is going to be coming on into to a club spotlight. So we also gadgets and gear, you know, one of my favorite topics. I love those rowing gadgets. I probably have too many of them, but we'd love to hear what what works for you and what what you'd like to to bring into the boat. Fun get fun stuff. Um, and I've got a couple of books coming out in my publishing endeavor. Pierce Press, Oceans Alive is going to be uh, coming up in September and World Oceans Day is in a couple of weeks so that we're gonna celebrate with that. Um, and again, you guys are the best. I really appreciate you coming on to talk to about, about Learn to Row. And I think it is one of the most important topics that we could cover you know, because it's where it all starts. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, you're welcome. Dave Harvey and Tara Morgan.